Good morning. I got nothing for you today, so we're going to go to those words of wisdom in the uh, bulletin, and uh, it is time for this to happen today. In Proverbs 21.8, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. We as Christians have got, I'm on my soapbox down here. <laughs> We have Christians have got to become bold and vocal and, and make sure people know where we ought to be. Now, let's move on. Tuesday, Bible study and prayer time, 7 o'clock. Invite everybody to come. Invite you every week. It's a good time to get together and hash over the sermon for the week. And, and uh, I, to this day, I have yet to see Dan back away from anything that he said on Sunday morning on Tuesday evening. Wednesday evening. Episode 3 of The Chosen. We're going to have a light meal at 6, video at 6.45. Come for one or come for both. I'm not sure what we're having to eat, but it's always good. Invite you to come, 6 o'clock. Next Sunday, we're going to go to Brookdale. I think we had a bigger crowd last month. Uh, we invite you to come. It's a good time to sit and, and uh, hear a little more uh, from Dan, sing a few hymns with the residents of Brookdale. It's a good time, please plan on coming and if you come to church on Sunday morning oh Sunday school next week I believe we're going to start a lesson called irresistible uh, like I told them in Sunday school I think it's a it's a a lesson for the church in the United States and it's a lesson for New Gotland Covenant Church so I invite you to come uh, it's a little video and then we discuss it and uh, it should give our church a charge on, on uh, getting revitalized and get going again. So we invite you to that. Then come to church, then go to Brookdale, and then grab your hot dogs, your buns, a lawn chair, and a dish to share, and meet us all at Coronado Heights at 5.30 for a hot dog weenie roast out there. We've done that, what now, for three or four years. It's a great time to get together for fellowship. Next Sunday evening at 5.30 at Coronado Heights. I see there's still a stack of Operation Christmas Child boxes out here. Um, if we don't get those gone, we won't make 50, will we, Kathy? Right. right. So uh, please pick up Operation Christmas Child box and, and fill that and bring it back. Um, only birthday this week is Dwight Kane on October 14th. So if there's nothing else, let's turn in our bulletin to the call to worship and let's read that together. <clears throat> Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. All right, here we are. I'm going to have to go to a long sleeve shirt. It's starting to get cold out there. Dan, uh, Dan and Lee have the white shirts on. Well, they didn't get me the memo. I'm still in August stuff. But it's great you're here and, uh, and everything. And, uh, th and thank you for coming back from Iowa. Appreciate that. And that's nice. Chris filled in for us. He did a great job. So. But we're going to, uh, we are going to sing, sing this morning like we always do. We're going to sing at Calvary, and that is on 338 of your hymnal or on the wall, whichever one you want to do. So stand with me and sing at Calvary. Years I spent in vanity and pride. Carry not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died.
in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come together on this beautiful Sunday morning you've provided for us. We uh, come together to worship you, to praise you, to sing our praises to you, and, and just to celebrate your love for us, Lord. Be with us today. Be with us through this coming week. Bless us richly as we go about your duties for us to, in this world, Lord. We just ask that you bless each and every one of us today and, and continue to be with us. We just pray this in the name of him who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. kind of got a little loud on that one. I didn't get loud enough, but loud enough to strain my voice. <coughs> and I, I got a lozenge. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and sing two more. We're going to sing 505 and 176, uh, Love Lifted Me and Lead Me to Calvary. These are great songs, seriously. <coughs> Just remain seated. We'll sing 505 first. <laughs> Sinking deep in sin, far from a peaceful shore, deeply stained with sin within, certain to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help. Savior wants to be beside. 
saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. What a what a great song. That's a good one. That's a toe tapper right there. That's great. It's good. Oh yeah. Lead me to Calvary. That's good with another good song. Oh yeah. That's a good one. 186. Well, good morning. Hope you're having a great morning here, praising the Lord. I just, those great songs. <laughs> Thinking of extra points I could add to the sermon that I've already written as we were singing. Uh, you know, it's all about Jesus and his love for us. And the message today is going to talk about how his love came down to a man who was helpless to save himself. He was bonded, in bondage to demons and Jesus intentionally, we studied about it last week, sailed across the stormy sea to reach that one man. And, you know, he did that for us, too. And it's all about Jesus. Take me to Calvary. And that's why we have the cross here on the wall behind us and, and the stained glass picture of Jesus. That's not him. That's just symbols of him. But it says so much about what he has done for us. Okay, well, that was the, the fifth point of the message. <laughs> I'll go back to prayer time now. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we just, we praise you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you for all that you have done for us. It's just, it's just amazing how you left heaven above, one with the Father and the Spirit, 
three persons, one essence, God Almighty, Most High. And you emptied yourself and came down to this earth and was born as a baby and grew up among us. And you lived among us for 33 years. And you ministered in that time. And you healed people. And you delivered them from demons. And you delivered them from sicknesses and other ailments. And you preached the good news of the kingdom of God. And you introduced the new age of the kingdom of God where we live under your grace and your forgiveness. Mm. And Lord, you paid such a high price to make that possible for us. But you broke the chains of death and you rose from the dead. And as we have faith in you, we know that we too, someday, will go through the valley of death. But we will break, you will break those chains for us. You hold the keys of death and Hades and we will have eternal life with you. And we're looking forward to that so much, Lord. But do help us now, in the meantime, as we live our lives in the place where you have put us. May we live for your glory. Lord, we want to lift before you some special concerns that we have. We, we think of our nation and all that is going on. We just ask for your mercy on us. And Lord, on of our state, and even down in Wichita this week, there's going to be a vote on equal access or unequal access, as it were, to those in special groups. And it just seems like a poorly written um, law that they're trying to pass. I pray that wisdom would prevail there and may love and truth shine through. We also want to lift before you the Oak Harbor Cottages and the work that's going on there here in McPherson, uh, this endeavor by about all the churches here in town and and the Christians coming together to make this available to those who are in need. May it be a place of great ministry and of great light as these people are introduced to you in the process of having their uh, essential needs met for a time. We pray for Lee's cousin in Seattle as he's in his last days with pan pancreatic cancer. And Lord, he's, he's one of yours. And so this is a time of pain, yes, and of diminishing and of, of parting, and yet it's a time of joy and graduation for him. Bless him and the family and Lee and Shirley as they travel out when the time comes. Uh, we just want you to be glorified in this and the family to be comforted and blessed. We pray for Dwayne and Linda who are home. Um, hopefully they don't have COVID, but Lord, they've been exposed to it. So bless them and watch over them. And we pray for James, my son, as he goes to Chicago this week to take care of some things with the Japanese embassy. And and opening the doors for him to go where you have for him to go. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, we also want to remember Rose Sheehan and her family and what they're going through now, especially Lisa and Mark. Lord, hold them steady and help them as they grieve the loss of Rose. We want to pray for those who are working in special areas where there's a lot of danger of COVID and especially vulnerable people in the nursing homes and the hospitals. We pray that you would protect them and guide them and use them in this ministry. We pray for Chris Sandow and her return from her special tests in Kansas City. Um, we ask that she would continue to grow stronger and healthier, look after her. We pray for Linda Friesen, Dwight Kane's sister, and Janice, Chris Sandow's long-term friend. And especially this morning, we want to lift Vern before you, Vern Henry, as he is having a really bad time right now between his cancer and the COVID and everything. Uh, Lord, just bless him and help him, and Jennifer too. And Dan, as he wrestles with cancer. And William, thank you that he is doing so well. Continue to strengthen him. And Steve, we heard a good report from Marie. She was up there with him last weekend that he's doing better and kind of getting some of his old spunk back. We pray your blessing on him and Marie. And Michelle, we ask for her strengthening. And April and Larray, as he has quite a bit going on this week with his medical treatments and consultations with the doctors. Bless that and may it go well. Lord, we just ask that you'd bless the rest of this service. May it be to your glory. And uh, also, Lord, 
as you search our hearts, you know what our unspoken requests are. We bring them before you now. And we thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I was looking here, this next song, uh, All That Thrills My Soul is Jesus, five, uh, 526. You know, what's that take? What's that take to thrill your soul? I mean, you know, uh, that's a good, that'd be a good sermon right there. I mean, yeah. because, you know, I was talking to my old buddy Sam there before service about riding motorcycles and stuff like that. And, you know, occurred, you know, and, you know, that's a thrill, all right. That's a pretty good thrill. But I don't know if that thrills your soul exactly. And uh, what's that take? You know, the Chiefs play tonight, and, they, and they, you know, does that thrill your soul? That's going to be over with pretty quick. You know, and so I think, uh, you know, this is a this strong song because, you know, uh, Mom, I, she sang this, so I sang, I hope I get through this one because she and I sang it. Uh, let's see what she's talking about, you know, all that thrills my soul. So remain seated, and we'll, we'll sing this one together. That's a good song. Jesus, by his presence all divine, true and tender, pure and precious, oh, how blessed to call him mine, oh, that thrills my soul is Jesus, he is more than life to me. Blessed Lord, I see love of Christ so freely given, grace of God beyond degree, mercy higher than the heaven, deeper than the deepest sea. Oh, that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me, and the fairest of ten thousand, in my blessed Lord I see, what a wonderful redemption, never can a mortal know, how my sin, though red like crimson, can be whiter my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see. Every need is hand supplying. Every good in him I see. On his train Divine relying, he is all in all to me. All that thrills my soul is Jesus, he is more than life to me. And the fairest of ten thousand, in my blessed Lord I see. By the crystal flowing river, with the ransomed I will sing, and forever and forever praise and glorify the King. All that thrills my soul is Jesus, He is more than life to me. And the fairest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see. That's good. It is, it is. <laughs> well, it's time for us to worship the Lord in giving. And uh, 
You know, and this, I'm going to read a little passage. It's another new one. It's about the widow's might, and it was a box like we have in the back there when she was coming into the temple that she dropped her coins. This is Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. Lee, would you come forward? Let's pray. Lord, we, uh, we thank you for what you've given to us, whether it's little or whether it's much. But you've given us enough that we can return some of it to you, whether it's the widow's might or whether it's out of great prosperity. Thank you for blessing us in our spirits. And Lord, I just pray your blessing on this offering, that it would go to the building up of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And please stand. Praise God. And you may be seated. Well, today our passage is in Luke chapter 8, and we'll be reading verses 26 through 39. Luke 8, 26 through 39. It's another long section, but it's really just one complete incident. But it's very profound, I think. Um, it's been a little interesting trying to figure out how to preach it, because uh, it's all about demons and things like that, which we don't like to talk about, but uh, we need to sometimes. So Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 39, I believe it's uh, 1002 or 1024 in your pew Bibles. Would you stand for the reading of God's word? They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him, and they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged go, to go with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. 
You may be seated. Well, there are three types of reactions to Jesus. There are three people involved in this, or three beings. The first one was the demons. The second was the poor man who was possessed by the demons. And then the third group was the people of the city. And those are three of our four main points this morning. Point number one was the demons acknowledged Jesus as the son of the most high God and then begged for mercy. And that's pretty significant. Hopefully we'll understand why after a few more minutes. Number two, the possessed man goes from torment and humiliation to freedom and peace and joy. Third, the local people were afraid of the demons, but are even more afraid of Jesus and ask him to leave. And then fourth, tying it all together, there were many bad things here. First, you got the demon-possessed man, and you got the dead pigs, and then you got the rejection of the people. But Jesus, in his omnipotence and in his following God's plan, the Father's plan to the his appointed plan to the letter brought all of these things together and used them for good. Okay, first off, we need to recognize that demons are real. They are at work in people today. Now, we don't generally see the kind of things that this guy had, you know, running around naked and screaming and breaking chains and things, but they do cause people to do destructive things. And by doing what the demons try to get people to do, those people allow the demons to have a power over them, which is very hard to break. People are driven to addictions, to drugs, to too much alcohol, to lust and pornography. And then there are fits of anger. There's pride and jealousy, which is so easily offended. And then there's pleasure in seeing others suffer. These are all symptoms of evil spirits influencing people, or even controlling them. Make no mistake, we cannot blame our own behavior on other people or evil spirits or the circumstances that we are given in life. The buck stops here. We are responsible for what we do, but we will either serve God or we will serve the devil. And we will either end up with God or the devil. And some people think there's middle ground between those two. I'll just be neutral and I'll go down the middle. But there is no middle ground, one or the other. The demons acknowledge that Jesus is God. Now that is impressive, isn't it? That what have you to do with us, Jesus, son of the most high God? They say that he is the most high God. They're confessing him. So does that make them Christian demons? <laughs> No, there's no such thing as Christian demons. Actually, in the book of James, James is talking about faith, which is what he's meaning by faith is where people just say, oh, yeah, I believe, I believe, and, but they don't do anything. They don't have the works, which it's not works that save us, but it's works that demonstrate the faith that we have that's saving us. And James says in, in chapter 2, verse 19, even the demons believe in God and shudder. And so it's not news to us, because we've read James before, right, that these demons confess that Jesus is the Son of God. At one point, Jesus said, so what's your name? And the demon said, Legion. And just by way of background, Legion was a term they used in the, in the Roman world for a, a group of soldiers numbering between five and 6,000. Now, the guy's not saying that he literally has five or 6,000 demons in him, or the demons aren't saying that there are that many of them, but there were a whole lot of them. Now, going back to what the demons said to Jesus, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. And that says a lot about the demon's world. We all have our world view, and in the spiritual realm, there is a world and that they, they can see. And it is a world of hierarchical order. Various levels of power and rank among the demons and even among the angels. And the demons know it very well. And they acknowledge that God is high over all. He's at the top of the hierarchy. Now, in case you're wondering, Psalms 8 says us human beings were made just a little lower 
than the spiritual beings. So we're just a little bit lower in that hierarchy than the angels and the fallen angels who are the demons. Another thing to note about the demons, because it's in what they said right here, is that they focus on torment. Demons torment those who they are demonizing. And they themselves are tormented by other spirits. The demonic realm is a whole system where the stronger and the bigger torment those who are weaker. It's like bullying on steroids. So when the demon asked Jesus not to torture them, they were probably referring to the future doom that we read about. He said, they said, don't send us to the abyss. And if you read in Matthew, it's a parallel account of this where Jesus went to the Gerasenes or the Gadarenes and confronted the demon possessed. They said, don't send us to the abyss before our time. Now that's in a detail. Matthew was kind of a detailed guy. Um, that's one of the details that he picks up and puts in his account. The devil and all his demons know that their doom is coming. There's no avoiding it. They cannot escape. So they do as much damage as they can in the meantime. You know, misery loves company, doesn't it? There's the attitude, uh, if I have to suffer, I'm going to make you suffer along with me. They hate God, and they hate all the good that God is doing. Their one purpose is to maim and destroy, to bring misery and hatred, and to cause unbelief in the true God and a false trust in our own strength. We see demon activity today, don't we? In our country, on the news, and among people that we interact with. You've heard about people making a deal with the devil. You know, they, they sell their soul to the devil. It's like they say to him, if you make me rich, or if you make me famous, or if you make me powerful, then I will serve you. Well, there's no dealing with the devil. It's not like a contract that you write up or oral agreement that you agree to and you both follow through on because the devil doesn't do that. He's a cheater. He may lead people to think that they can make a deal with him. But anytime a person gives allegiance to the devil, they lose themselves. As Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, for what does it profit, what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and forfeit his soul, lose his own soul. I don't know how many of you have read The Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien or seen the movies, but for the however many it is that have, there's a scene in there that this is so, so apropos, so much like, and I don't want to be a spoiler, but the last scene, there's this creature called Golem. He used to be uh, maybe a hobbit, we're not really sure, and he's all about getting the this ring, it's a one ring of power, and that's, his, that's all he wants. He's, he's overcome with that, and at the very end, he gets it, but in the process, he falls off a cliff, and you see him falling in the movie. You see him falling down into a river of lava, and he's holding the ring up, and he's staring at the ring, smiling at it as he sinks down into the lava, into his own destruction, and then at the end, the ring is floating there on top, and it just sort of dissolves in the heat of the lava, and it is destroyed. Well, that's what it's like for someone who gains the whole world, and they lose their own soul. There are some people, and I'm not going to mention any names, in our country, in our society, that are driving. They're very wealthy, and they're driving what's going on culturally. And maybe they're on top right now, but they're going to be sinking down in that burning lava, unless they repent, and I do hope they repent. So a person may be, attempt, may be tempted by certain favors and apparent abilities from these evil creatures, but it is only the bait to get that person into the trap that will hold them for their entire lives and take them to hell. Now, that's the bad news. The good news is there is deliverance in Christ, but until someone comes to them in the power of the Holy Spirit, they are helpless and hopeless. So the moral of the story is don't dabble in anything in any way associated with the devil or the demonic. Now, if you're like me, as you read this passage and the demons say, don't send us into the abyss, uh, let us go into those pigs so we can kill them. It's like 
Why did Jesus even talk to them about this? Why does it seem like he's negotiating with them? When they begged him, he allowed them to have their request to go into the pigs. Why didn't he just go ahead and say, no, you're done. Into the abyss now. <laughs> Why did he allow them to remain in the world? After they had finished with the pigs, they probably went on to cause other mischief in the world and in people's lives. Why did Jesus put up with that? Well, the answer, as I understand it, is this, that God is doing everything in his time. God has an appointed time. And it looks like, when it looks here, like Jesus is giving in to the demons when they begged him, just like an indulgent mother might give in to a bratty kid. That's not what was going on. What was happening is this was not God's appointed time for them to go into the abyss. Jesus tells us clearly in Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, that there is a place, an eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. As Jesus is telling about the judgment, and he's dividing the people into the right and to the left. And the ones on the right go to heaven, and the ones on the left, he says to them, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So the day is not yet when the devil and his angels are to be thrown into that eternal fire prepared for them because the day is not yet for the human inhabitants of the earth. God is being patient and merciful and he's allowing time and opportunity for those who will to come to him until the full number have come in. Now let's take a look at this demon-possessed man. It doesn't tell us how he became demon-possessed, but he was powerless against him. They could speak through his mouth. They could make his body fall down. They could give him the strength to break chains. And we read of other incidents where people are demon-possessed. They do all kinds of damaging things. They cut themselves. They fall into the fire. All kinds of destructive things to the body. And the demons have the power to do that. <laughs> And as I mentioned earlier, the demons don't like to be tortured. They begged Jesus, don't torture us. But they sure loved to be torturing this man. They had him running around naked. And his behavior so upset the people of the town, the city there, that they, they tried to chain him up and put him under guard. And that didn't work. He, he, he would break the chains with the power of the demons, and he would run around crazy again. And so finally, they drove him out of town. What a lonely, humiliating, miserable existence this was for the man. He was trapped, and he could not do anything about it. Though they had control of his body, I think on the inside, his mind knew what was going on. But this day, by the appointment of God, Jesus comes to the shore of this man's hangout, to the cemetery there on the, on the edge of the cliff. And you know, not even the storm at sea that we talked about last week could stop Jesus. That's what he set out for at the beginning of the passage last week. It says, one day Jesus got into the boat with his disciples and he said, let us go across to the other side of the lake. Jesus had an appointment with this guy and no storm was going to stop him. And then Jesus arrives there and there's a spiritual conflict between Jesus and the demons. The son, Jesus, the son of the most high God. And this poor guy that was possessed by the demons was probably watching helplessly and afraid, and yet hoping that Jesus would release him from this prison that he was in. R.C. Sproul says that Jesus acknowledged by his actions that it wasn't time to send the demons to the pit, but it was time for them to come out of that man. And when the demons left for the first time in a long time, there were no voices in the man's head. He had peace and he had rest. Jesus' disciples fed the man, helped him get washed up, clothed him. And there he was, sitting at the feet of Jesus. He couldn't draw himself away from the one who had showed up and saved him finally from what he was going through. It says, later, when all the people of the area came, they were afraid of Jesus and asked him to go away. But the man who had been freed wanted to go with Jesus. What a contrast. He desired Jesus' company, Jesus's company as much as the others dreaded it. We could all learn from this man. 
How much do we want the presence of Jesus with us? Do we want him there when we're watching television? What would he, what would he say if he were sitting across the room watching with us? Do we want him there when we're telling stories or listening to stories with coworkers or friends? Do we want him there when we get lost in our thoughts, wherever they may take us? Think about that. <laughs> and now on to the people. This man had frightened the people so much when he was demon-possessed. They couldn't control him and probably drove him out of town into the tombs so that he wouldn't be bothering them. So now they see that someone even stronger than this man and the demons who possessed him had come along and broken the power of the demons. Someone even stronger. So they were more afraid even of Jesus than they were of the demon, demonic host that was bothering this man. They didn't consider that the power could be for good and not evil. All they saw was a tremendous power, and they were afraid. Perhaps they didn't want the responsibility to live under God's way. At any rate, they were more comfortable with the way things are. Thank you very much. Please be on your way, is what they said to Jesus. And Jesus left. And that brings us to the fourth point. All these things are happening. We see some good in them, but... All of it does work together for good. And it's kind of like a chain reaction. Jesus used this event to bring the people of the good news of the kingdom of God. He used things that were evil to accomplish his purpose. The man possessed by the demons was in a very bad condition. In casting out the demons, Jesus agreed, them, agreed to allow them to go into the pigs. <laughs> that wasn't so great for the pigs nor was it very good for the owners of the pigs. But what is the value of eternal life? How much is it worth? Certainly a herd of 200 pigs. A good thing happened, and the man was saved. Now, when the demons destroyed the herd of pigs, the guys that were watching the pigs ran into town and told everybody in the city and in the, in the country around there what had happened. And so it says all of these people came out to see Jesus and what was going on. That's another good thing. He got attention. But it says the people were overcome with fear so much that they didn't want Jesus around. They had seen and heard of his amazing power, and they asked him to leave. Not such a great thing, but they did have Jesus on their mind. Then it says the man that had been demon-possessed wanted to go with Jesus. That would have been great. If I'd have been him, that's what I would have wanted to do too. Let me hop in the boat with you and we'll, I'll just become one of your disciples traveling around. But Jesus said, no, stay here. The man was probably a little bit disappointed. But he said, okay, I'll stay here. And he told the, Jesus told the man to tell everybody what God has done for you. And it says that's what he did. He went around all that area telling people. Okay, so Jesus left, but he didn't go defeated he went away, having accomplished his purpose. Number one, he delivered the man who had been enslaved and miserable. Number two, he had gotten everyone's attention from that city and the countryside around it, and they were listening and paying attention to God's message to them. And then number three, the demon-possessed man had been prepared by Jesus to be a witness that the people would listen to. When the man spoke, he had authority because they knew what he was saying was true. They had seen it with their own eyes. And then the, God's word, the Bible tells us in Luke, or no, in Mark, we're reading in Luke, but in Mark, he says later, Jesus came back to that same area. And the reception the second time around was way different. The people received him with joy and the crowds we're proclaiming his praises. So it looked like a negative, 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 and Jesus had to leave with only one person delivered. But that was the way God had planned to reach these people. So what do we realize from this incident? We can see that things that we, can, that we consider evil or bad can be turned around by God to accomplish his purposes. There's no depth of depravity that a person can fall into that God cannot touch them and turn their life around and make them a messenger, an instrument that he uses to tell other people about the good news of his kingdom. 
he accomplishes his purpose. This week I heard a story about a man who had become a porn star. That's what he wanted to do and that's what he did. He'd become a millionaire. He'd even won awards for those kinds of movies. I didn't know they had them, but he won acting awards. After he had achieved all of that, he looked at himself and he was unhappy and he wanted to die. So he got out of pornography, but he was still depressed and couldn't have, didn't have any reason to go on living. Then one day, he met a woman, and she said, why don't you come to church with me? And he did. And that morning in the service, he heard the good news of the kingdom of God, and he received Jesus Christ, and he received the new life that Christ had, and he was made free and alive in Jesus. Now, that miserable former porn star, you would not expect him to be able to have a healthy, intimate relationship with a woman. But he married that woman, and they have children. And not only is he a good husband and a father, he is glorifying God as a pastor of a church. So no one should ever choose a life of depravity. But there is no one, even in any kind of terrible condition, whom God cannot reach and rescue. That's the takeaway for this today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you <laughs> that in your appointed time and in your appointed way, you rescued this poor guy that was full of demons. And most or all of us have not had that kind of an evil experience, and yet all of us have had experience of being in the devil's camp of being directed by evil spirits or coached or tempted or pushed. And Lord Jesus, you come to us just like you came to this man with your Holy Spirit one by one. By name, you come to us and call to us and bring us to yourself. Help us to be like this man, Lord, to glory in your presence, to never want to leave it, and to be your witnesses, telling others about what you have done for us and about your glorious word and your truth for us. Strengthen us in this way, we pray, and thank you so much for making us part of your plan. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Dan. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, that's good, good stuff there. Pay attention to all that. Okay, well, thank you for being here and uh, tuning in overseas, wherever you're from. Good luck to you, young James, going up there. Be careful. And um, we are going to uh, end with a closer service with uh, hymn number 44, which is, and this is another thing to strive for, to be uh, the children of the Heavenly Father. So stand. We'll sing that one together. Such a refuge here was given. God his own doth tend and nourish. In his holy courts they flourish. From all evil things he spares them. In his mighty arms he bears them. Neither life nor death shall ever from the Lord his children sever. Unto them his grace he showeth, and their sorrows all he knoweth. Praise the Lord in joyful numbers, your protector never slumbers. At the will of your defender, every foeman must surrender. Though he giveth or he taketh, God his children ne'er forsaken is the loving purpose solely to preserve them pure and holy. 
And now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.